And with that, I'll turn it over to Ben. Good evening. Thank you all for being here. Um, so tonight's topic is restorative agriculture. Can you hear me? Is that good? Okay. Tonight's topic is restorative agriculture, and we've all, we hear many terms in agriculture. We hear conventional, we hear organic, we hear biodynamic, uh, sustainable. Um, so I guess we have another word now, and the real point of this is that many different agricultural practices can accomplish good things, or labels can accomplish both good outcomes or bad. And the real focus today is I'm going to present how agriculture affects the Earth's surface, and how in managing so much of the Earth's surface in agriculture, we have, it's, it's been a detriment, we also now have an opportunity. Um, so I'm going to start. This is a diagram of our, rough, rough diagram of our carbon cycle. The, um, our basically photosynthesis is, has been the main vehicle by which carbon's been taken out of the atmosphere and brought into our, into our fossil reserves, our soils, um, and our living biomass on Earth's surface. About five billion years ago, the Earth was mostly carbon dioxide, the atmosphere was mostly carbon dioxide. Um, we had no life on Earth, and the first life on Earth were photosynthetic microbes that started taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and bringing it into the Earth. And the reason I brought this diagram to, to, to bear is the, I want to point out that these numbers are in billions of tons. Um, and right now, we are, are facing a major climatic crisis. Um, we are letting out, if you see the factory fossil fuel cement and land use change, we're letting out 9 billion tons of carbon emissions per year, plus many, much more methane and nitrous oxide. And if you look at the picture of the ocean, you see phytoplankton in the ocean life system is bringing about 92 billion tons in and letting about 90 um, billion tons back out, the ocean sequestering about 2 billion tons of carbon dioxide per year. And on land, photosynthesis is bringing in about 123 billion tons uh, per year. And then plant respiration and microbes are letting about 120 back out. So that if we look at the math of this, we have a tremendous problem. 9 billion tons of carbon is going into the atmosphere each year, and the land and ocean is only bringing back Five, five billion tons of this. So each year, four billion more tons of carbon dioxide are going into our atmosphere. And why is farming so important in this? Well, farming is so important. If you look at this map of the world, the green areas are where we have where we have crop uh, pasture land, and the uh, orange areas are where we have cropland. And of course, there are many other smaller locations. But over 40% of the Earth's surface is now used for agriculture. And if the Earth's surface is what's photosynthesizing, and the areas where we're using agriculture are the areas capable of photosynthesizing along with our forests, if we don't manage our agriculture properly, how can we bring more of that carbon dioxide that's getting up into the atmosphere back in? So what I want to talk about today is we all, I think it's been pretty well established, we need to cut down our emissions and our pollution off the Earth's surface. But on the other side of this equation, we need to re-stimulate and rebuild our Earth's surface to bring carbon back in. And in the 40 to 50% of the Earth's surface used for grazing and raising crops, we have an area that's traditionally, for the last 200 years, been letting more carbon out than it's bringing back in. But we have the potential to manage this space differently and actually start to address our issue. Um, I wanted to, so I'm going to talk about Stonehouse Farm about five years ago. Um, Abby, her brother and sister, took over the management of Stonehouse Farm, about 2,000 acres just south of us. And Stonehouse Farm was, had been conventionally managed in growing genetically modified corn and soy predominantly in what became a no-till rotation. Um, and we, at that time, we embarked on, uh, the decision was made to convert the farm to organic and we started a planning process. And I'm just going to show you with you a first picture. Um, and an example of what we were just talking about. On the left-hand side of this picture, you'll see a, a soy stubble. On the right-hand side of this field, we planted, we planted a cover crop. That's better. And, and I just want to point out the real basic issue here. Imagine that 42% to 50% of our Earth's surface is used for agriculture. 
And many of the modern techniques leave the land after harvest looking like it does on the left. That land's not photosynthesizing. It's not contributing to life. It's not really successfully helping our water cycle, our carbon cycle, or any of our nutrient cycles. On the right side of this picture, you'll see a cover crop. And this cover crop is a mix of oats and peas and clovers and annuals and perennials. And it was, the point of it was to cycle nutrients, to stimulate photosynthesis, and to feed soil microbes in the soil. <clears throat> this next slide is a picture of the soil from the picture on the left. You can see it's kind of bland, a little bit packed, and not very lively. And this is a picture of the soil on the right. And this is just 50 days after planting the cover crop. You can see, you can see the roots penetrating the soil. You can see soil aggregates starting to build around the roots. Uh, if you look close, you can even see some legume root nodules. And the real basic point I'm trying to make is that somehow in, in our discussion about climate change and agriculture, we've forgotten that this land surface is the only way we can actually actively take a hold and manage our carbon cycle. And even in the ocean, where I showed you earlier, we have m much of the ocean's problems are stem, stem from our use of land, particularly agriculture. Our, nit our nitrogen runoff, our phosphorus runoff, are all exacerbated by, by techniques where we don't use cover crops. I'm going to go back to, the, to this picture here. A soil like this, with no living roots, any excess nitrates and phosphates are, very, are liable to leach out of that and end up in our waterways and then collect in our ocean and coastal areas. Where a soil like this on the right is much more likely to hold these nutrients back and prevent them from leaching out. So when we, what, when we went into our transition at Stonehouse Farm, we had three major focuses. One was the community we were in and how this farm could fit in. And we decided at that time that we would become a supplier of, of needed inputs to, a, to the community of farmers. We have a burgeoning farming scene. A lot of smaller farmers looking for inputs and a lot of mid-sized farmers looking for inputs. So we figured if we can farm regeneratively and produce local inputs, then we can help other local farms have an underlying resource that's regenerative. And then the next, the, the next we started to sh shape through what's our philosophy for the land and the soil. And we decided that organic agriculture, what does that really mean? Organic stands for organic matter. And organic matter is matter that's about 57% carbon. Organic is really referring to building carbon in the soil, to build a set of life in the soil that can then cycle nutrients. More organic matter means you better cycle your water. And we really decided that we want to put the organic back in organic farming. It's, it's beyond the importance of not spraying chemicals or using synthetic fertilizer. We wanted to focus on rebuilding our soil. So we, our main points around that were let's keep a constant living root in the soil. If it's not cold and dormant, let's keep the soil alive like this. Um, and let's also minimize our tillage. When you turn soil over and expose it to the air, the C, which is carbon in the soil, meets the oxygen, the O2 in the air and cre can create CO2. So the act of tillage has been a tremendous contrib a contributor to climate change over the past 200 years. If you think of the Dust Bowl, as we turned over that land and we lost many feet of topsoil that were rich in organic matter, we flooded our atmosphere with carbon dioxide. And the act of tillage itself, in this, and it's a, it's a sin that goes from small-scale farming to large-scale all around the world. Tillage is what man has done in the Neolithic age, and we've, uh, we've brought now that we're in the Anthropocene and we're still tilling, it may bring us to our end. Um, and I want to point out our next photo here is a picture of cover crops. And this adds the, to the philosophy of basically keeping a constant living root in the soil, constant photosynthesis. As farmers, our responsibility is to keep photosynthesis happening. We're stewards of an earth's surface and we're in an ecosystem that's supposed to be green and photosynthesizing. So this is a cover crop of legumes, of brassicas, of grasses, annuals, and perennials, and it was planted right after a small grain and in preparation for corn the following year. So in order to avoid using heavy synthetic fertilizers or organic fertilizers that could potentially leach, we really focus on using cover crops. And you see the red flowers there, that's crimson clover. 
that's fixing nitrogen for our, for our next crop. And then the taller grass is, a, that's rye, and that's <coughs> mainly a high carbon crop, making sure that we balance the nitrogen and carbon in our soil to try to keep as much carbon in the soil as we can. Um, in order, I'm going to focus these next slides on the reduction of tillage and the replacement of tillage with many people, historically tillage has been used to control weeds and to create a clean slate for your next crop. And when you till, you release carbon, but you also shake some nutrients free. So there's sort of a quick boost and followed by a decline. Um, instead of tilling, I want to point out some things we do. If you look at the brown stubble in this picture, that's weed stubble. And underneath it, you see clover. And this wheat was planted no-till under soy stubble in the fall. And this picture is taken after the wheat was harvested the next summer. The spring of that same year, before harvesting wheat, we spread clover seed into it. So instead of having to till, we just harvested the wheat and the clover was already there. And we're basically looking at, a lot of this is common sense and practical, but we're trying to think through, in the act of continu maintaining continuous photosynthesis, reducing tillage, and stimulating root growth, the deeper and deeper we can send our roots into the soil, the deeper and deeper we can send carbon. The deeper you go into the soil, the easier it is to store carbon. The higher layers of the soil are much more likely to respire, where we can <coughs> release carbon and bring it back in much quickly in the top layer, but it's more volatile. So a big reason we do these cover crops is also to send carbon deeper and deeper into the soil. This next slide is of rye and hairy vetch. And traditionally, um, you would, an organic farm may grow rye and hairy vetch to plow under before growing corn. And we actually have developed along, we followed the rodeo technique and developed it with a few tech, you know, added a few things on our own. And what we do is a, on many fields is a form of no-till agriculture that's called organic no-till. No-till is originally, I, I like to look at Fukuoka and many people like him as the, uh, as the originators of no-till, but it was sort of hijacked by the conventional industry, um, who said, well, we can no-till by using, by making genetically modified plants that are resistant to herbicide. We can plant these plants, spray an herbicide like Roundup, which now we're all finally being told is carcinogenic, and, um, and it's no-till. But the point is that that's a shortcut no-till system. That's a no-till system in which you're killing soil biology to allow a synthetic fertilizer to feed a plant that's bred to survive the Roundup. So in this no-till system, if you look on the, on the right side of the slide, we've used a roller crimper, which you'll see in the next slide. It's a large metal roller filled with water with baffles every six inches that rolls this rye and vetch down and breaks the stem every six inches. And what it does is it kills it and lays it down in a mat. And that mat helps hold the weeds back, helps hold moisture in the soil, and it also helps protect the soil surface and all the microbes on it. Here's another picture of, as you can see, the roller crimper in action, smashing down rye. After rolling and crimping, we no-till right through the rolled mat of cover crops. You can see the tractor here. We, we took an old school, conventional um, no-till planter. We modified it to cut through our cover crops. And what this does is it just opens a small amount of the soil to let the seeds in. And instead of inverting the soil, we maintain a nice thick cover of thatch. The, plant, the planter itself helps smash down any extra standing rye. In this picture, you can see on that same field I just showed you, the soybeans emerging through the rye that's been rolled and pressed onto the surface. And here are those same soybeans about five weeks later. And here they are approaching maturity. And sometimes they're a lot weedier than this, and sometimes they're this clean. We've been able to accomplish yields on, our, on an average over our last four years, about 80% the county average, using organic no-till techniques. And in doing so, we're able to hold much more carbon in our soil. And we, we almost have no erosion now that we're able to keep this thick thatch on the soil at all times. This is a slide of a very successful corn plot where we rolled and crimped rye and veg. It almost looks like we sprayed a chemical that's actually mechanically killed and we 
planted the corn right through it. And this is a, a no-till cornfield at about knee or waist height. This is one getting taller. And what I want to talk about now is that in, as we've embarked on organic transition and really looking at what does this land need, I want to point out that, as we talked about earlier, we're using 45% of the Earth's surface for agriculture. And thousands of years ago, we weren't doing agriculture. Humans were much more, we were much closer to our roots. We were hunting our food, we were gathering it. And in a way, agriculture was, was the beginning of the way we cre created civilization and the way that we started to organize ourselves differently. But all of our civilizations, potentially even our own right now, have collapsed with our agriculture. In Mesopotamia, in ancient Egypt, in Europe, deforestation, overuse of our soil, over tillage, has run us, run us out. So we're at a point now where we need to assess what ecosystems we live in and how can we balance food production in these ecosystems. So what we're starting to layer on is, in, we're in the Northeast, and I'll show you a few slides on what we need to be thinking about here, but we are an ecosystem that really wants to be a forest. And this ecosystem wants to be a forest all the way out into Nebraska. And we have to try to figure out how do we grow food and not devastate our environment and hopefully actually improve it. So it's a very difficult time. So in, our, in, in doing this, and on, in, as a steward of the amount of land we're farming, beyond just the cover crops and eliminating tillage, we're now trying to figure out how can we incorporate animals, which is done very well here at the dairy and we're starting to do at our farm, when we have this excess biomass and we need to convert it to more bioavailable nutrients. How do we do that? So we've been using cattle at Stonehouse Farm and that's going pretty well, there's more we need to do. And then we need to start thinking about other species. If we are still importing some organic fertilizer, and if we're gonna start growing our food in systems where we're not bringing nitrogen, right now we're doing two things. We're taking carbon from the ground and putting it in the air. And we're taking nitrogen from the air and putting it in the ground. And then that either leaches out into our water, some of it goes to the crop we want it to, and some of it oxidizes and becomes nitrous oxide going back into the atmosphere, which is the most, one of the most potent greenhouse gases. So in, in an effort to cycle our nitrogen better, we are starting to rotate animals across our cover crops, and we're rotating perennial crops into our farm. So after three or four years of annual cropping, we seed down in the blends of perennial crops, where we'll do no tillage and just grazing and some hay making for three or four years. And over those three or four years, the roots will keep growing deeper and deeper, deeper than annual crops. And in that perennial part of the rotation, that's when we're really building our soil carbon. And we're really building a healthier, more stable soil microbiology. Because these roots, and the more species you include in it, they're feeding things to one another. And if you give them enough time, the roots will actually create mycorrhizal fungal networks and start sending nutrients and microbes to one another. So bringing perennials back into our agricultural rotation is essential and it's become economically something a bit of a challenge at the beginning but now I'm seeing that going into the perennial rotation helps us come back out into our annual crops and really help us reduce and eliminate our need for fertilizer. We've been bringing in composted chicken manure and I'm very ready to stop so I'm <laughs> counting on perennials for that. Another piece we're starting to work with is while we're in our perennial portion of the rotation while we're in our perennial portion of the rotation, our, we really want the perennial roots to drive deeper and deeper into the soil. And we've purchased something called a keyline plow. And it's not a plow like you'd think of. It doesn't take the soil, flip it over, and expose it to the air. It actually goes through perennial crop, like you see in this slide here, these slides. And it has wings, and it cuts channels underneath your topsoil, just in the top of your subsoil. And it loosens the soil from the bottom up and allows your perennial roots to surge deeper into the subsoil. And as we send perennial roots into subsoil, as roots shed, re retract in winter, that helps start to build a bit of an organic matter base in the subsoil. And the idea of the key line plow is to stimulate perennial roots my, including, including legumes, forbs, deep roots such as chicory, and also grasses, 
to build a more biodiverse network in the subsoil. And then each couple of years you go in deeper and deeper with your key line plow, and the idea is to grow topsoil down. When you think of soil, intuitively we all think that soil, well, it grows up, you know, the leaves and the grass and all of that piles up and makes soil. Well, the truth is that most of that actually just is oxidized by microbes and sent back into the atmosphere. What, what of the surface litter ends up in the soil is often dragged down by worms. And if you till to incorporate that surface litter, some of that may turn into organic matter, but you've also <laughs> tilled and you're letting carbon out. So it's, it's sort of like the concept, if you think of a tree, we often think that that tree is made of things that came from the soil, but it's actually mostly water and carbon that came from the air. And what came from the soil is only a minute part of that tree. So it's the same with soil. The fastest way we can grow soil and the biggest place to push our soil is deep, is underneath the topsoil in the subsoil. It's soil there, but we want to expand our topsoil horizon down. And that can be done much faster than expanding our topsoil up, which happens around thousands of years. I'll take questions for a long time at the end. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and another, if you look to the middle, um, it's an example of the plow on the left slide. The middle slide is an example of a field. Key line plowing is really an, it, it done on a land type design that was developed by a man named Alan Yeomans in Australia. And it's, a, it's beyond just doing what I explained for the soil. A key line design is a way of really assessing a landscape based on contour and topography. And designing it so that it, we can move water from what you call valleys to ridges. So if you think of a topographical line and you have an area where water's rushing and eroding, you want to catch that water and move it level or at a slight downslope outwards to where you actually have a ridge. So we're starting to assess our farm's design and how we even shape our fields. We're on a farm where hedgerows were pushed out and fields, as many rectangular type fields were designed, which is really at odds with the way the water wants to move. And a tremendous part of restorative agriculture, perhaps way even more important than carbon, is our water management. So right now we're all thinking, or probably rolling your eyes, like, well, we have, we've had, you know, we're, we're turned into Oregon here. But in some times we're really dry, such as this spring. And in a couple of fields we do have designed properly, we noticed that the water held much better um, this spring, and we had better crops early. And in, as we go west into the United States, water is becoming a crisis. So a key line design where you're moving a plow like this on contour. So you're catching your water in the areas where it wants to collect and moving it out to the areas it's running away from is a great way of conserving water underground and balancing water across a landscape, which is a, not, a huge challenge across the world. We're very lucky in our region, but as soon as you get to the central Midwest and further, all the way through the American West, down into Mexico, up into central Western Canada, and across the world, sub-Saharan Africa, land design and water are essential. Once you design your water flows, it becomes a lot easier to use the, all the practices that I just explained. So while we're sort of like, we have a luxury of water in our area, we're still assessing our land shape. So that if you look at a field, that was a rectangle cut on a landscape going like this. In the low spots, we'll have often too much water. In the high spots, not enough. So redesigning our land to balance that is, is another essential part of what we're doing. And the next step of this is somewhat conceptual. Uh, we've begun designing in our key line design how on the farm we're going to plant trees and hedges. Um, in certain parts of our farm, it's going to be large open spots, but in some areas, particularly our low waterways, which were tiled in a very traditional way, tiling can be helpful. But it also sometimes, in some of our fields, it takes too much water off too fast. So we're looking to rebuild some, tr some forested areas, particularly where we have forest islands. Um, and in some areas, we may start doing some alley cropping. And these are just a couple examples. The top is a key line landscape. Um, and the bottom is a picture of a combine combining wheat in walnut trees in France. Um, at our first, I'm going to start talking about what we've been doing to, to monitor what we're doing uh, as, we've, as we've gone through this process. Um, but first I'm going to do a little bit of a recap. So the, the keys that we're really thinking of in our farming system are maximizing photosynthesis, cycling nitrogen using legumes, incorporating perennial crops, 
using as much no-till farming practice as we can in our annual crops, incorporating, um, as I said, animals earlier to cycle nutrients and to stimulate the perennials, um, incorporating key line plowing to start to push our soil horizons lower, and then starting to think about how the water flows in our systems. Um, and what we, about four years ago, right the first year of our organic transition, um, Abby and I really wanted to think through how can we monitor this transition of this land that's pretty sterile, um, that's really sort of a placeholder for synthetic nutrients and, and genetically modified seed, and how can we watch the soil and the farm as we go through this change of farming technique and watch how the, watch how the soil changes. So we decided to start a research project, and it was called, first we called it the Hudson Valley Carbon Farming Research Project. <laughs> and then, I, I can't really remember how to say it. Um, so we very quickly cut it down to Hudson Carbon. And through FAI, the parent organization of the dairy, we made Hudson Carbon a project. And about four years ago, we chose 12 sites across the farm. And our plan was myself and David Goldstein and a colleague of mine, Matt Shepherd, who's here, and Anchio Adarneto, we're the original four. And we started thinking out, well, how can we look really track carbon in the soil? We could do simple soil tests. And then we looked into that and we realized that many universities were saying, well, why, you know, just take a, a grid pattern of the top six inches of the soil. But that didn't seem to make sense because our roots go a lot deeper than, than six inches. Um, and we weren't just growing GMO corn and soy where the roots might only go that deep and then it would be blank and then we'd go back again. And then we started thinking about all the parts of the carbon cycle. We have atmospheric greenhouse gases, we have carbon stored temporarily in living plants on the surface, and we have carbon that's de decaying and decomposing and dead litter on, on the soil surface. And then we have all the layers of the soil going down with roots and microbes. The roots don't decide to stop at six inches for the soil test. So we started to design a set of protocols. Um, and we started with biomass. We have some guests. We <laughs> <laughs> So we started thinking, how does carbon enter the soil? And the, it's really by the agency of photosynthesis. And photosynthetic activity is really um, represented by the health. The healthier and thicker your plants are, the more photosynthesis you're going to have. So we came up with a biomass monitoring protocol to monitor just how much carbon, how much biomass we have at any given time. So we do it every month on all 12 sites. We also are doing soil coring. So in the spring and fall of each year, we take three one-meter soil cores. And then we cut these soil cores into five. We take three soil cores to make one sample. And we lay out all three cores from around each site. And we take the five, we cut them into five samples to understand the carbon changes at different depths of the soil. And then we, of course, we monitor and document what we do on the land. So every, every date that something is done on the farmland, or something if we apply an organic fertilizer, or if we do a tillage action, or a no-till action, or we raise cattle, or we plant, or we harvest, we document all of that, what it cost us, so we can track if we've gained or lost money, and what our production was per acre. And then how, and on these, the idea was to do these 12 sites to really, not so much in the scientific design, but do <coughs> scientific monitoring of the land, and just monitor what we did in our, in our rotation. Um, I'm going to stay there. And then after um, two years, we realized that it was going to be really important to start watching the gas fluxes in and out of the ground. And we also realized that none of us were uh, really that educated. We had come up with a good way of doing it. And at that time, we were introduced through a gentleman named Tom Garreau to a scientist at the Woods Hole Marine Biological Lab named Jim Tang. And we are joined by three members of the Woods Hole Marine Biological Lab team today. We're here, Fa Ming, Wang, Sebastian Lei, and Jin Zhao. And we are all, these, they've helped us bring our project so much further forward. And we have now, in addition to these 12 sites, added three sites of our farm, where we have a, um, a real scientific design of what we're doing. We have one site, which is an organic rotation of corn, to soy, to wheat, where we'll use our no-till practices and cover crops and organic fertilizer on a Knickerbocker loam soil. And a conventional neighbor is doing the same. 
And the, um, our folks, our colleagues from the Marine Biological Lab have set up um, monitoring systems in which not only are we using, doing these techniques, we're doing an enhanced biomass monitoring and every week we go out with a chamber and we watch how much carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide is coming in and out of the soil around those sites. We have five rings set up. Woodshole is also set up a, a monitoring tower where every 30 seconds the carbon dioxide reading out to the perimeter of the field is red along with wind direction. And also, for beyond that, a fluorescent system for solar-induced fluorescence. And the idea of this is to understand fluorescence is a, a, a sort of a weak wave, not as strong as infrared, but it has a direct correlation to photosynthetic activity. And we're working to use our suite of monitoring techniques to really try to calibrate our understanding of what strength fluorescence wave indicates what level of carbon uptake or loss. And the long-term goal of this is to be able to monitor land and farming systems such as ours um, using simpler, lower-cost techniques such as solar-induced fluorescence and, and simple baselines. Um, and an another um, experimental design we have is one we'll be expanding on. It's in front of the farm here. And in the field across the way is a perennial field that's used for planned grazing and haymaking, but it's all in perennials, blended. Um, and we are monitoring that field in our regular suite of techniques and this fall we'll be doing a methane analysis of the field. And the idea there is to put a methane sensor in addition to a CO2 sensor there. Because as we all know, we hear about cattle and how bad feedlot cattle are for our atmosphere, which they are. Cattle emit methane. But when cattle, if you think about cattle, if cattle are located on a cement feedlot, and that cement really can't handle them very well. But on grasslands, grasslands have um, many microbes, but two of the predominant ones are methanogenic and methanotropic bacteria, and they break down atmospheric methane. So that we're going to be getting a, a figure, figure out how much methane the cattle are letting out, and then watching this field's methane cycle with cattle on it to understand if the field's breaking down more methane than the cattle are letting out, and we're hypothesizing that it will, and that a cattle system in which cattle are finished on grass and don't go to feedlots is, actually has the potential to break down more methane and sequester carbon and be a benefit to our climate. And that hypothesis ba is based on a really long history we have with herbivores on this planet. Um, if you think of the Great Plains, all the way from northern Canada to Texas, they were built by roving herds of herbivores. And this is a climate that was too brittle for the grasses to break down on their own. The bro what broke down the grasses were animals eating them and trampling them. And when they did that, the roots retracted, but these animals were surrounded by predators and moving. So when they left, those grasses had dung and urine on them. They'd been pushed down. If you think about a brittle climate, the only thing that can break down the remaining grass that the animals didn't eat are the soil microbes on the surface, and those animals would push it down. And over I don't know if it's hundreds of thousands or hundreds of millions of years, our Great Plains became 10 to 12 feet deep. And the same thing on the, on the um, savannas in Africa and the steppes in Asia. And in basically 150 short years with a fence line, we've taken this process and broken it. And I feel I'm, I'm going to backtrack a little because I want to talk about animals. Managing animals you can, do, you can destroy land right here with animals very quickly. <coughs> Two days too long on a muddy field, and you've, put, you've set a field back a long time. So we have to use temporary fencing and management systems to keep animals moving here too, so that they just eat the top of the grass and move on, and you don't come back until the grass has recovered or become even more healthy than it was when you, left, when you first went on with cattle. So we now, in our, our systems, we think there's a gentleman named Alan Savory who came up with what's called holistic management. And we try to use his fundamental principles in thinking of our management systems and how we move animals. He's from Zimbabwe, and he watched the national park system with fences take beautiful land and completely destroy it. So he saw the fence line as the enemy, and then he realized that if we've destroyed a nature, the only way we can rebuild the systems are to emulate what nature was doing and move these animals in such a way 
that we mimic that nature. I hope that makes sense. I want to point out a couple other things we're playing with, and hopefully next year we get further along with. We've started to do some drone monitoring of our land. And we started with something called ENDVI, which gets a, a basically a strength of the vegetative index. So the darker the green, the more vegetation you have. But our hope is that next year we get a good enough grasp on the solar-induced fluorescence system that we can actually be doing maps like this of, so, of solar-induced fluorescence on fields and carbon sites. It's very tricky technology, but the idea there is that from the air, we can start to monitor what's happening on land. And the reason we feel that's important is because it's very expensive and time consuming to do practices such as soil pouring, biomass collection. We're doing this more advanced study to really prove out different techniques and rotations that accomplish our goal. And we're trying to calibrate potentially lower cost systems such as aerial ones to move forward with. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit more about why we're doing this in, um, and how it may fit into in, in some economic solutions it might, might work with. So as, as a big reason we're doing our work is to help with legislative, uh, private and legislative push to address two issues. One is um, that we don't have much control over as in what we do or is that we feel that pollutants should be taxed and that the, the ecosystem services such as what we're doing should be rewarded. So we are trying to develop metrics for different land, especially in farming, grazing, and, and, and cropping, which techniques are actually capable of sequestering carbon, sequestering methane, and eliminating or eliminating the leaching of nitrates and phosphates, and stopping the flow of nitrous oxide out of the soil. And in doing so, we are trying to help our local assemblywoman, who's here today, who, and her chief of staff, Kristen Williams, who's also here, who, they wrote a bill called the New York State Carbon Farming Act. And we are trying to, as a first, use our research to help support this. And our midterm goal is to develop a planning tool that farms and soil offices could use to, um, to basically predict outcomes if farmers are to use certain tactics. Um, so we're trying to get this bill passed now as a pilot program for our counties. And we're also working with a consultant now to, pack it, to take all of our work and package our sequestration into carbon credits that we'll sell to private buyers that are interested private parties. And we feel that if we're going to really address our environmental problems, we need to think of this differently. We have an economic system that really has two inputs. It used to have three. We think about it in terms of capital and labor. We used to think of it in terms of capital, labor, and land. And land represented that the land had the base resources that we were applying capital and labor to for an economic outcome. And in the late 1800s, we adopted um, a new school of thinking, which is that, oh, the earth doesn't have that many people and we have lots of resources, so why don't we scrap the land? And that allowed for constant growth and it also allowed for money um, to be issued. Basically, money is created when debt is issued. Um, and it's not backed by anything real from the land. So what we're thinking, we really, in regenerative agriculture, we're thinking all the way back to that level. How do we value what our land and what our earth and what our ecosystems do for us? And we're taking a basic first stab at it in the space of carbon because it's measurable and it's measurable to see where it's dug up and where it's let out and how it comes back in. It gets more complicated when you go to methane or when you go to nitrous oxide. But we feel that with all of the major things that sustain life, such as our nutrients, water cycle, our oxygen cycle, we need to come up with economic equations that coincide with the science and the real facts of life if we're to have a future. So that's the basis of why we're doing this research and why we're farming in this way. Um, I could go on for a lot longer, but what I thought we'd do is go on and have a, a question and answer session. I'm happy to answer any questions I'm capable of, and if I can't answer it, I'll let you know or send you to the best reference I can. So thank you very much. So we'll say thank you, and thank you really very much. Um, and I'm going to ask if there are questions, if people will please um, 
stand up and I'll see how far we can get the microphone to you for questions. How do you incorporate wetlands? A lot of our farms do have them. How do you incorporate wetlands into your vision for the economics? Would um, like to come and speak uh, to them? want to say it? The question was, how do we incorporate wetlands? And the answer is, first off, it's critical that we leave our wetlands. And in our farming system, we have some areas where we can expand wetlands. We need to think of not just getting rid of all the water. In certain areas, we would like to be a little less wet. And in other areas, we're already so wet that we should be adding more water or rebuilding our natural system. So our wetlands are, I think, an important part of our system. And I think any long-term solution to this type of work, there's an even greater value. It's important that we get carbon into farm soils, but wetlands and forests have an even greater potential. So I think as part of this type of thinking, we actually need to understand that while they don't have much economic value to a farmer, our wetlands are precious. And they're precious for biodiversity. It's also precious because under that water, we're generally anaerobic. So any carbon that ends up in that water is much more likely to stay. So we're with Stonehouse, we have a couple areas where we've just decided we can't really farm this anymore, or we can only do cattle here. And there are wetter areas, and when it's too wet, we'll keep cattle off because wetlands are certainly part of the system, and we, we have to respect them. And that's, that's sort of how we treat our wetlands. We're just beginning to treat our wetlands. In the past, our farm is completely drained. So a lot of wetlands were lost, and now we really need to rethink, are there parts where we should let wetlands come back? And I don't think we need to drain too much more of it. So, honor the wetlands. Yeah. Deborah. So my question is: In one of the earlier slides, you spoke about um, growing these methods at about eight percent of the average in the mm -hmm. county. Um, do you have any statistics on the money? So, I, so the economic benefit on soybeans is pretty clear. Our, our average yield is about 80% of the counties over the past four years. And our cost is much lower because we don't fertilize them. We use rye as the previous cover crop that helps bring the potash up. And our seed cost is lower because we're not buying genetically modified seed with a patent. Um, on corn, our input costs are actually pretty similar to conventional because we have to add extra organic compost. We don't have to, but we do to get our yield up. And on wheat, our input cost is about the same per unit. But where we make out better is that our yields are, not our yields, but our, our value of the crop is higher. That being said, I think that in the scheme of things, the fertilizer inputs we're using don't really have that high of an ecological cost, whereas on a conventional input has a pretty high ecological cost. But on a dollar per dollar basis, we're producing our soybeans and our hay a bit cheaper. Uh, the gentleman here in the middle. Uh, you reference cattle. What about sheep and goats? Sheep and goats can be even better. Cattle have cattle that have more methane per animal unit than sheep and goats. The issue we have is I have a small team and I don't have anyone ready to be a shepherd yet. But sheep and goats are a really important part of the solution. And I think in many ways for our region could be an, a, this area used to be a huge sheep area. We had hundreds of thousands of sheep in Columbia County. And we're thinking about it, but we haven't, we haven't moved in that direction yet. But they're really smaller ruminants, are more efficient with methane, and more efficient with grass. So they could be a tremendous part of the solution as well. Margaret? Um, half answered this question, but are your labor costs higher than a conventional farmer? Yes. But if that equals out in that you get more money for you. So where we're, our, Margaret asked if our labor costs are higher, and they are. We have to spend more time on the land than we did when we were conventional. So our labor costs are up about 50%, but our income from our organic crops, again, and that's not on a yield basis, that's on because people pay more for organic. Um, but it does take more labor. 
And when I really think about that, I, I, I think it's important to really understand how many people actually work in farming in our country, and it's down to about 1%. Um, and it used to be over 50%. At the beginning, probably 80%. So I think in a way, we, it, it's kind of a shame that we've made it so big and so convenient with chemicals that so few people actually do it. Sir? Uh, how much of a contribution uh, to carbon sequestration does well-managed grassland bird habitat uh, make? Grassland bird habitat? It depends. I think it would very much de depend on where and also how the grasslands were managed. So in our region, a grassland that, um, that's just mowed for once a year, say for birds, that's going to have a pretty big carbon benefit. I'd, I'd imagine you're bringing two to three tons per acre per year into the ground. Um, again, in our region, the, the most efficient thing, if I was just trying to farm carbon, we would reforest our whole farm. And I'd say the same for a, a forest, uh, like a bird habitat, you know, that if you're, it really depends on how, how, much, how much forest you're allowing to come back with that grass, but it's certainly a habitat that can be very ecologically beneficial, and especially for the birds and biodiversity, it's a, it's a very good habitat to have. We have a couple pastures where our cattle manager works. He set up a series of bird houses, and it's been amazing because actually, it's cattle and birds, but what the birds have done is cut down the flies on the cattle in that one little part of the farm. We notice the difference. And there's a question right here in the front. by other farmers, not necessarily the research side, but more the fact that you mentioned both the e e and the and the forest and the so As you design more complex fields and you have more complex management, how can other farmers, big and small, adapt both the practices and the technology? Sure. So I think that the, the first step that we're seeing across the country for adaptation is cover crops. In major conventional farm country where people are still growing a lot of GMO corn and soy, we're starting to see major cover crop programs. In Indiana, we're seeing less in Illinois and Iowa. Uh, we're seeing more in Missouri and we're in the Dakotas as well. So I think that cover cropping farmers are catching on too, especially now that there's um, really economic problems in farming and people are having to they, you know, treat their soil better to put less money into it as far as inputs. Um, but I think the, it's a really tough one for me. I talk a lot with, con we have a conventional neighbor who's growing non-GMO crops for us now with cover crops. And the first step that I see is they can agree on not tilling because it saves them money and even though it's conventional, big brings their organic matter up a little. And they are starting to agree on cover crops. They're starting to see the benefits there. Um, but when you talk about things like subsoiling to build a deeper soil horizon, their first, call, their first question is, well, where do we have the time or money to do that? And where, but when you go back to a much smaller farm, um, like the, ones, the one I grew up on, when you start key lime plowing or adjusting your land shape, you're often a smaller farm selling at a higher price and you're using it on a smaller space, so that becomes much more feasible. Um, but as far as scaling to landscape, the real issue when you, if you really want to go whole hog and you want to subsoil the ground and you want to start going to a key line landscape and planting trees is that it does cost money on the front side. And we, the, until we develop a better economic model for the long term and the value of these economic benefits uh, or ecological benefits, it's, unless there is a good, good backing, it's hard to go all the way. And even where on a farm such as ours, where we had backing for the transition, now we're on our own two feet, um, to stage in the key line plowing, we're only starting to do this four years in. You know, so it, we haven't done it on the whole farm yet. So it's really a, a time scale issue. And I, again, I think a lot of this goes back to how can we find funding mechanisms through potentially partners in the private sector that want to offset their carbon credits, or through local water conservation groups, how can we connect farmers to environmental groups to our economy in such a way that we can find funding for these mechanisms, large and small? And it's a question I don't have all the answers to, but it's certainly, it's sort of the crux of the issue. But there are some really, um, some very encouraging things in the cover crop space, and then also some very discouraging things. Um, I think, for example, the conversation about animal agriculture has been, should really be focused on how animal agriculture is being done, not the existence of animal agriculture. We have people, um, many animal rights activists are focused on 
elimination of animal agriculture and even things such as laboratory food. And this is all a race to the finish. Um, we need animals to help rebuild ecosystems. But if we put them on a concrete pad and remove them from an ecosystem, they're absolutely a problem. And all of those groups are validated. So I think that in the space of animal agriculture, we need to, we need to rethink um, what we're doing as a country and how we're doing it. Uh, for example, we have 100 million acres of corn, about 100 million acres of soybeans, and maybe 80 million acres of wheat. And when grain prices were really high eight and nine years ago, Central Europe, um, we're talking about think Russia, Ukraine, Romania, Uzbekistan, they started growing lots of wheat. And our wheat prices have not recovered because we lost that side of the world's wheat market. We also, over half of our corn crop is being used with our taxpayer subsidies to make ethanol. And it takes more energy to make a gallon of ethanol than it does just to use a gallon of gas. And soybeans, we are in this uh, pretty silly trade situation and there's not even enough demand to sell all our soybeans. So we have a situation where we've pushed all these annual crops in the ground and we've taken out all kinds of perennial grasses and prairie and we're upping our imports of beef. <laughs> so I think in the picture of this, we actually really need to re re um, in the scheme of what I'm talking about, there's a rebalancing of agricultural policy in general. So as the, as the public, it's hard, it's almost impossible already to navigate all the food labels and arguments there are. But if you go back to the big picture, which I think is really important, and you look at maps of how our land is used in America, and if you start thinking through how much do we actually need to feed ourselves and those who depend on us for food, um, and where, are, where is our food coming from, you can start to see some pretty practical solutions. And uh, I'm sorry I'm going on such a long-winded answer, but I think that we, the encouraging areas are in cover crops, but we have, there's a big duty we all have and where we can affect this the most in a polarized political climate is, um, is with our purchasing. We need to purchase foods that represent the practices we want to support. And I think that that is, is if you're at a farmer's market or you're talking to farmers or you're at the store, you, even if the farmer doesn't know what this idea is, bring it to the fore and then buy something from them. And it just gets that conversation going. And that's, that would be my, my advice for progress. Kristen. Um, you're obviously creating a model that I think all of us would agree will, will, will stand as a great model for the state, you know, in promoting carbon farming and, you know, working on this pilot project together. The two questions. How about pests and the reduction of pests? Because I know a lot of farmers are going to want an answer to that question. Does this also prevent my loss in yield because of so I'm just wondering about that part. And the second question, unrelated, um, when it comes to the cover crops and the no-till and the roller crimpers and trying to encourage smaller farmers to do this, what kind of potential do you see in the area for a cooperative use of some larger equipment that a smaller farmer can't really afford you know, to use, or, or buy or rent? I, I know that on some areas, maybe through the soil and water conservation districts or through Cornell cooperative extensions, there are there are opportunities to lease or rent some of the farming equipment that might help transition a small to medium farmer into doing some of these things. Can you talk a little bit about what you know about that potential in this area? Absolutely. So with pests, um, it's been an interesting year because our area actually got hit by corn borer this year. And we noticed it first in our hemp. And then we did some studying and we realized that it used to be called the European hemp borer. And then hemp disappeared and the borer stayed and we grew more corn and started boring our corn. So, <laughs> so we, um, and that hit us on our organic farm and in conventional farms. And the main issue that we, we get from pests are there's a few influences. One is monocropping. If you're using the same crop in the same location over and over again, you're liable to get more pests. In a system like ours, we, this was the first year in our transition we really got hit by pets by, since our transition. So we're organic now. And before that, we hadn't been hit yet. And our crop rotation and actually this breaking the cycle up with cover crops that can bring in pred good predator, predatory pests and invite birds is a natural way of helping fight pests. So often by bringing in cover crops and longer crop rotations, you actually reduce your overall pest load in general. Um, but we're also dealing with sort of climate chaos and changing weather. 
So we, these big swings in temperature, and rainfall, and dry, it can often be very inviting to pests because it can sort of start to put stress on our, the balance of our ecological systems, and those are the moments where we invite pests. So we sort of have a, a thing where I actually think these practices are one of the better ways we can help to generally fight the systemic issue of pests, although we'll never be perfect. And on the local equipment sharing side, it's something we need to figure out. It's very difficult though. The issue is that when you need your roller and crimper, everyone else does too, because there's a time to do it. Something like a key line plow can be done through the year. Something like a no-till drill has longer windows. So I, dear, for example, some of the, the our NRCS officer, Natural Resource Conservation Service, is part of USDA. Historically, they've been much stronger, and surprise, surprise, they're a little weaker right now. Um, they have traditionally been very good with grant programs, lending programs to sell conservation tillage implements, such as no-till drills. I don't think they know what a key line plow is, but if they could be educated, they'd be helpful. I have several friends that this year received grants for 80% of equipment purchases on smaller equipment to help with their conservation. So I think encouraging and working on the USDA to keep funding NRCS instead of corn and soy subsidies, this is the kind of direction we need to be going. Also, on a small local level, there are smaller farms that, um, there are, that do share equipment. And we share equipment with some of our neighbors, too. Um, so it's a, but it's, what's tricky about it, I'm looking at Nate and Margie, I used their cattle trailer yesterday, I don't know if they know that. Um, <laughs> but I think they used our affordable corral a couple of weeks ago. So. <laughs> the, the real, the, the big issue that we have here is, um, is that everyone often needs the stuff at the same time. So there's some equipment that can be more portable, but some things like your corn planter. The last thing I want to talk to you about is borrowing my corn planter. Because I hope I can't promise you anything until I'm not going to lend it out to you before we're done. And after we're done, it might be too late for you. But things like a no-till drill where you have bigger windows in the spring, late summer, fall, the seed down pastures, that's more realistic. And, um, and things like a key line plow, that's something where people really need education. And for example, we have a small one that we'll be outfitting to lend to someone for a few months because we have a bigger one. But it's actually, I don't have a wonderful answer for that question because it's, it's kind of fraught with challenges. Um, I, there's a, it's often a great, it's a great starting point of fights between farmers. It's, hey, uh, where's my cultivator? <laughs> um, does anyone have any more questions? Dee Dee. Could you just talk a little bit more about where you see the methane issue going and is there sort of a 30,000 foot uh, perspective on that yeah. that turns that into a way that we could actually get transportation in this region or something like that? Uh, so I think uh, methane has, we have a real basic issue is that most of our dairies are huge. And even though we don't support those dairy practices, there are ways to capture more of their methane. So that's one go-to. The number one system I see is we need to start talking about methane as a real serious pollutant. We talk about carbon dioxide, and in a way, carbon dioxide is actually, it's a pollutant, but it's also an opportunity. Some greenhouse growers pump their greenhouses full of carbon dioxide to grow plants. So our, our carbon is actually readily broken down by plants, but methane is really only broken down by healthy bacteria. And the more we cover our, the more we compact ground and break out the oxygen, the more methane we get. Um, the more we cover land, the more methane we get. And so I think that our methane issue is first education. Um, the second issue we need to talk about is how do we promote the healthy systems that break down methane? And the third is how do we bring this argument that we're not trying to get rid of animals, we're trying to move them back outside onto pasture. Um, and then at the very end, there's another technique too, which is there are substances such as biochar and humates that if used slight, small, tiny amounts in animal feed, and then at post eating in their manure, you can break down the methane emissions from both the animal and, and the manure itself. So these are other, the other thing about biochar and humodes in the manure is that it soaks up a lot of the phosphorus and nitrogen before, when it, while it's highly volatile and could leach, you can grab, grab it into the biochar and humates. And then that biochar and humates can be used to fertilize soil and that phosphorus and nitrogen will slowly leak out. Um, it'll also break down, because often these manures, if they're put in anaerobic conditions, they'll produce more methane. 
if you use these, these substances, you, they'll produce less methane as well. Another part of it is what animals are eating and, and how those diets are managed. So I think that methane is, there's a multi-pronged approach. Number one, trying to get animals outside. Number two, treating the manure and the diets of the animals to try to break down methane. And number three, and which could also be the most important, is just educating the public about methane and its importance. It's sad that we can, we're thinking that we're so advanced as a society and we don't even understand our water cycle, our carbon cycle, our methane cycle, our nitrogen cycle, our phosphorus cycle, calcium, and this is what we're actually made of, what we're breathing, and what we're belching out every day. So like the basic stuff of life. Um, so I think methane is part of this conversation where it's like we need to start to think of the politics and economics of real proven scientific cycles that sustain life as we know it. And I would say that's my 300,000 foot <laughs> answer. <laughs> Ma'am? Um, are, are you thinking about, and if so, are you tracking the uh, ratio of, of fungal to bacterial matter in the soil? That's a very good question. We've done some initial essays on that to, to understand our balances. <coughs> And it's been, I did, we did some with uh, doc, uh, Dr. Aileen Ingham, and then we did some with a, another lab in Long Island um, called Earthfort, and one with a, a group in Oregon. It's all, Earthfort's mainly in Oregon, but they have a branch in Long Island. And we started to see what looked like good ratios, but it was hard to tell if the testing was accurate. And a huge part of our, our work moving forwards is to start to understand biologically what's happening. And I'm glad you brought that up, because in the talk, one thing I didn't talk enough about is that the real essence of all of this is biological. So plants, I, I wanna bring this back a little bit, and I'm gonna use your question to do this. When a plant takes sunlight in, and then it, in its, in its chlorophyll, it's made photosynthesizing and chloroplasts, it's making sugars, okay? And carbon, and these sugars are carbons. Not only does the plant build itself with these carbon blocks, but like all energy exchanges, there's an excess. So the excess sugars and carbons are let out of the roots of the plant, where they're then consumed by soil microbes. And these soil microbes are, uh, there's carbon to nitrogen ratio is usually three to one, and they're, so they build themselves with this carbon. But they'll also eat this carbon and fart it back out and it'll go back into the atmosphere. And sometimes when you have a more fungal soil, these sugars can turn into something through mycorrhizae called glomalin. And glomalin is a soil carbon that is a potential precursor to humus. So the, the reason we did these tests was to understand what's the, so our soil biology like, so what's our potential for sequestration? It's highly linked to your biological health of your soil. And the biological health of the soil is very linked to the nutrient density and health of the food you eat, and then that has a direct effect on the biological health of you, which is, I think, the future of, of understanding our health is the understanding of our microbiome. So I'm sorry for such a long-winded answer. We've done this testing, but our, our concerns on it are we haven't found a laboratory where we can really do, we, until recently we have found one called Mr. DNA, and Woods Hole has some ideas too of um, how we can start to do sort of like a, uh, a, a map of all the microbial families in our soil and their levels. Because the, the, if you use these farming practices, your, different, your results can vary wildly based on the biological composition of your soil. So all these carbon cycles, and I, I am sort of embarrassed I didn't get into this deeply in the talk, but I'm glad you brought it up are really deeply related to soil biology. And a huge part of what we do at planting that I didn't mention either is we, meant we inject compost teas, which are biological microbial inoculants, adjacent to our seeds to help stimulate the plants. And there, this is just downright essential because in one tablespoon of soil, if it's healthy, it has the potential to have more living organisms than there are people on Earth in one tablespoon of soil. So if you think of, and in our own body, we have billions and billions of microbes. So I mean, if you look at a person, it's often to think a person's really a community. And, <laughs> and, and we're all grown from this huge community under our feet. And in an era where we're trying to r really use our, our science in a technological way, 
we know almost nothing about the biology underneath our feet. And what we're really doing in sequestering carbon is feeding the biology under our feet using plants. And the hardest part of this monitoring is going to be figuring, figuring out just what that biology is. Because the moment you dig some up out of the soil, you completely change that biological community. Some of these organisms live for 30 seconds, 10 seconds. You know, we're talking, so measuring this is, the, is sort of the new frontier of soil and soil monitoring. So while we can get the bio, the um, sort of the chemical, physical um, monitoring down pretty well, the next trigger we need to start to understand of how do we, the, the real potential in making these systems work even faster, because we know with certain techniques that we're using how fast, you know, we're seeing pretty good results pretty quickly, but we think that the frontier for rapid soil carbon sequestration is really going to be understanding the microbiology and how we stimulate it best. Sir? Yeah, I was just curious if you had thoughts regarding the term regenerative agriculture as a label, um, you know, buzzword, or even a certification to reach consumers and general audiences as a way to raise awareness and demand <coughs> for products and practices. Uh, within that umbrella, or if you think there's maybe a better general audience term, label, more precise or broad way to encapsulate what you're pointing at and to, to help build uh, positive feedback on that, the way that organic as a label has done. Yeah. And so my view on this is that regenerative is, the, is a real word about what we're trying to do to our ecosystems. We're at a sort of degenerative point, in my opinion, of civilization and our, and our, and our ecosystems. So we're at a point where we, need, we do need to regenerate them. But my concern is that we have many different labels already. And then, in so many words, I think it's stronger than sustainable as a, as a term, because sustainable, what do we want to sustain? If we sustain what we have now, we're all done. So regenerative is what we, ha we have to regenerate. Um, but as an organic farmer who grew up with organic farming parents before this, it sort of got so corporatized and large, my feeling is, is that we want to preserve stronger labels like organic, but we need to be activists in those because we have so many organic farmers that aren't, so much organic food that really isn't organic. It's grown in systems that lose carbon. So I like, there's a regenerative agri organic standard that Rod Rodale Institute has helped co-sponsor that I think is a really good idea. But I, so I'm sort of conflicted. I think regenerative is a great part of a label, but I don't, I'm hesitant to leave um, organic behind because we fought so hard for it and now there's a fight against those of us who fought hard for it be to, to simplify it and water it down. And that's been pretty well accomplished. But I feel like we have an opportunity using the word like regenerative to say, well, I'm us using regenerative organic practices. I'm sort of putting the organic back in organic. is a good way to describe it. So I'm, I'm hesitant to go, go towards a whole new certification, but I very much promote the word uh, as a way to farm. And I think that we, in sometimes in our race to make things a, a, cert, a, a label, we often damage the conversation at a time when we need, I think the term and the conversation needs to spread. And then from there, people can could decide how to use it. So I think we're a little early for that, but I think it's a potential. Steve, and then you again. Yeah, well, following up from what you just said, um, it seems to me like countless studies now have been done on the communication around climate to the general public. And what are the right words to use and what are the wrong words to use? And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about, in the agricultural community, what sort of um, language you have found to be the most effective in communicating with conventional ag. So in conventional ag, I think that the key words, and I, I wish we could be a little further than this, but our, you know, preventative, preventing erosion, um, reducing inputs, and then also the, we, the weather's, you know, may, how do we protect ourselves from major weather events? So some of the folks in conventional farming don't yet totally believe that humans are the center of the cause of climate change. And when you're farming that way, I can see how they might like to believe that. So you're often talking about resiliency. How do you prepare your farm to better protect against these more extreme weather events like the 32 inches of rain we've had in the last 80 days here? Um, so you're talking about 
we've on our stone house we've had 32 in the last 80 days. The um, so I think that you're talking about resilience. How do you build your system so that you can still get onto fields and get into the soil in your time frames? And you're talking about making your soil more friable and able to receive and hold water. Water holding capacity is crucial. So you want to talk about mainly, I think, water, preventing erosion, and resilience. But I also think it's a time where we just have to talk about the issue. Um, the, we have, I, I, don't, I think climate change is a nice term because it's a great way to kind of make the whole public feel like, oh, the climate's changing, but you know, we'll change with it. I think the real issue is we have like a climate catastrophe and we're right on the edge of it. So I, I, what I do is I, I do talk to conventional farmers in those terms first, but I make it pretty clear that I feel like we have a climate catastrophe in our hands and we have to act, all of us are stewards of this land. And we have this really hard fight as farmers where farming has traditionally been a fight against nature. You know, you chop down the trees, flip over the soil, and the, the nutrients that oxidize grow your crop. And in a long time ago, when the earth was big and there weren't too many people, you could come back to that plot 15 or 20 years later or five years later. But now in a place like Haiti, where my wife is from, or in lots of Africa, the, community, the population's so high, you're back on that same plot every single year. And in America, where we plowed away most of our topsoil, we're at a point now where we really have to try to grow food, but we have to, we have to grow enough food for us. We also have to rebuild ecosystems. And on top of that, we're facing climate chaos. So in my communications, I talk about the real issue in front of us, uh, you know, as far as what, that we have a climate disaster. And depending who you're talking to, I say, well, with this major weather we've had, how do you want to focus on holding your water, not eroding, and being able to get on your fields when you need to? So I, I, I speak practically, but I also am pretty clear about my belief of what we're facing. Ma'am? No, no, and actually that's a wonderful thing that we don't have to do. So we've, um, we, we, we grow them together, but they harvest at different times of the year and plant at different times. So corn and soy are harvested at a similar time, but small grains like wheat and barley and oats, <coughs> peas, they're harvested between late June and late July. So, and we try to make our first cut hay. We finish planting corn and soybeans. If we do spring, so I'll start with uh, the spring. Okay, so in March, if you're lucky, late March, you'll plant some spring grains. Realistically, it's usually April. And then that planting is quickly followed by soybeans and corn. And then we go in and make our first cut hay. And then after that, we'll start harvesting the small grains that were planted that spring or the fall before. After we harvest small grains, we make straw and then second cut hay. And then we start harvesting our corn and soybeans and right as we harvest our soybeans, as soon as they're done, we'll plant fall grains, so such as winter wheat and winter rye that are planted and established in the late summer and fall, and then they go dormant in the winter and grow back in the spring. They also mature. And so we spread it all out. Um, when in crops and farming systems where you're on just corn or just corn and soybeans, you have to do all your planting at once and all your harvest at once. So the more diverse your and as you move into animals, they too, they have, you're really finishing them late, late in the year after your corn and soybeans, ideally. Um, and then if you're, if you're managing chickens or sheep or goats, depending if you're milking them, that's an everyday thing all year round. Or if you're getting eggs, that can be every day as well. So a lot of this is I, we're really promoting diversity on farms which allows for an income stream from a diverse number of crops that are planted and harvested at different times so you can spread your, your timing out better, um, which is, I think, a great benefit to us. Okay, I was going to take two more questions. I was told last, but I'm going to take two more. <laughs> Sir? Uh, do you have any thoughts you recommend food for us? Uh, is there any uh, future planner in incorporating some I, uh, some manifestation of a food forest on this farm? Or on Actually, farm? yes. So we started mapping out about 150 acres of the farm for replanting the riparian buffers and fruit trees. Um, we're starting with the riparian buffers and hardwoods and starting to think through where, if we don't do it, we would, we would invite someone to bring fruit in. Because if you look at pounds of food per acre, 
fruit trees are really outdo most everything else out there. Um, and they're, we're actually working with a group called Propagate Ventures, who's starting a nursery on our farm. Uh, and we're going to be buying trees from them, and they're bringing this exact type of farming to our area. We have orchards here, but they're bringing it in a regenerative, organic way. So in our farm, we plan in three years to start some reforestation work. Um, in four or five years, we'll start going down into some small areas of fruit. We also have a couple old orchards on a farm. Um, we've cut down some of them, but most of what's left, Propagate's going to try to work with. So we've, it's something, I'm, it's not my expertise, but I see it as a key part of, a, and for our region, a really suitable type of farming, because we're a forested region, or ecologically, this area wants to be forest and wetland. So going to for, as much forest agriculture as we can is a great way to manage our land, probably the best <coughs> ecologically. I'm going to take one more. Is it economics to industrial, industrial organics, mm -hmm. which, which some would argue undermine the original mention of organic agriculture? Yeah. You can be organic, but still, still heavily and uh, not cover crop at all. Uh, going back to the economic economy that you mentioned earlier, uh, how can you prevent the sale of carbon offsets from following the same pattern, say, the Catholic Church of sale of indulgences, <laughs> the gay rights market? <laughs> I think that in order to, in order to avoid these abuses, it, there's number one, you have to document. Um, you have to document, and there's a lot of con talk about using blockchain technology to document a carbon credit as a source, so that it's not sold twice, which is one potential abuse. Um, you also need to be able to verify that it was actually sequestered. And then there are issues like, what if you farm properly for 10 years, and then someone took it over and plowed it all under? So there, it's, it's very complicated, and with the consultant we're working with, we're starting to speak with about this, we're talking about part of the carbon offset, any funds you bring in would go into an escrow account that could be used against any potential loss in the future. So I think to build this out, it's a highly complex model. You have to insure against future losses. You have to make sure there's no double counting. And then you also need to connect it to a real thing you're offsetting. Um, so you have to come up with some sort of a pound per pound basis of what you're offsetting and that being what it's paying for is actually bringing that amount back in. Um, there have been a lot of sort of knockoff efforts to do this that haven't been successful. So I think what we're looking at is uh, several years of work to pull this together. Um, but I think there's many mechanisms that have to be thought out to ensure against this. I, I just want to say something to what you're saying is a huge question. And the issue is how to make some motion forward while we're in the middle of the economic system <coughs> and get some funds somehow to help turn it all around. And we're just, we're in a difficult situation. This is a mechanism. Give that, that the mic. Sorry. <laughs> just saying, this, this idea of, of having this paying for damage and getting paid for good behavior, which is Dean Barrett's bill, that's the whole idea of it, is, is it, it has great dangers of the sort that he's, he's talking about, I see, but it, it, has, it, is, a, it is a possibility if, if people like Ben are watching over it and doing it and trying to not allow the corruption that is, that is gonna be rampant. It's just, it's a piece of the work to be done while we're in the midstream, which is what we're in. Great. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you once more to Ben. Thank you, really very informative talk. We have um, a cheese and sun tea reception prepared if people would like to stay. And I just once more again want to acknowledge our partners at Scenic Hudson. Um, and I think Kristen Gamble has joined us now, so welcome. Um, our scientists who are here from Woods Hole, thank you for coming. And Dee Dee Barrett and her staff here also. Um, so thank you, thank you all for coming.